Oh, wrong person. That's me. Half a day. The joint informational briefing by the Committee on Health, Tourism, Historic Preservation, Land and Justice and the Committee on the Environment, Revenue and Taxation and Procurement is now called to order. Today is Monday, April 15, 2019. The time is now 3.11 p.m. Notices for this joint informational briefing was, were disseminated via email to all senators and all main media broadcasting outlets on April 5, 2019, and again on April 12, 2019. The notice was also pub published in the Guam Daily Post on April 8th and 13th, 2019. The purpose of this joint informational briefing is to hear the government of Guam agencies on the Navy's draft supplemental environmental impact statement, overseas environmental impact statement for the Marianas Islands Training and Testing Area, or MIT. The draft SEIS OEIS assesses the potential environmental impacts for the proposed military actions in the Marianas Islands Training and Testing Study Area. Public comments on the SEIS and OEIS are due April 17th this Wednesday in 2019. We have invited the Bureau of Statistics and Plans, Guam Environmental Protection Agency, the State Historic Preservation Officer, the Guam Preservation Trust, and other GovGuam agencies to discuss the potential impacts from the proposed actions in the MIT area. I would like to acknowledge my colleagues here today. Uh, to my right is Senator Therese Terlahi, also the co-chair of this joint hearing, uh, for uh, who is a chairperson of Health, Tourism, Historic Preservation, Land and Justice. To her right, we have Senator Kelly Marsh Titanu. Uh, to her right is Senator Amanda Shelton. To my left is Senator Mary Torres. And to her left is Speaker Tina Minnie Barnes. Thank you everyone for joining us here today. So now we begin uh, background of the MIT study area. We are going to show some slides. Thank you. Just, this is just for a very general background for the public. Um, so one of the ways that we can have input on this MIT, uh, the government of Guam doesn't necessarily say yes or no to the military's plans for training or testing in the area, but, but we are um, able to make comment on their plans or on this supplemental environmental impact statement. So public comment period is until April 17, and the draft MIT supplemental environmental impact statement is available at this website, mitt-eis.com. The public is encouraged to submit substantive comments on the scope of analysis, including potential environmental issues and viable alternatives. You can submit your comments online. Given the huge scale of activity already allowed by the MIT and the Navy's plans to expand, it's important to compile and share government and resident information regarding the impacts on Guam's resources, environment, and health. This is, a, it, this is a map of the MIT area. It, it, I'm not sure we can enlarge that, but if you can see um, the light color shaded area includes the islands of the Marianas. And there's a, thank you, there's a red dotted line. That was the original Merck area. So the MIT expanded the Merck area to the, the light green shaded, light blue shaded areas. It pretty much doubled the, the area of the Merck, which was the Marianas Islands Range Complex. This also includes a corridor that goes from the Mariana Islands to Hawaii, like a transit corridor, those dotted, uh, also light colored lines to going towards the right of the screen. That's a transit corridor where training and testing is also allowed. So in 2010, under the Merck, um, the Merck was 497,469 square nautical mile live fire training range surrounding Guam, Rhoda, Tinian, Saipan, and uh, all but the islands furthest to the north in the Mariana Archipelago. The Merck authorized live fire on and in the land, air, and sea throughout the training range. 
At the time the Merck was established, it was described by a Department of Defense official as the largest Department of Defense live fire training range in the world. In 2015, the Navy signed a record of decision for the final Mariana Islands training and testing, which we're now going to refer to as the MIT. Uh, the ROD, the record of decision, doubled the sea-based ranges and land-based areas that allow the Navy to conduct sonar and live fire training and testing activities that include the use of active sonar and explosives. This study area encompasses the entire ocean under the Merck and further expands the range of the training to 984,600 square nautical miles, and which was described at the time to be larger than the states of Washington, Oregon, California, Idaho, Nevada, Arizona, Montana, and New Mexico combined. So the MIT study area, uh, as you see, also includes around Guam Upper Harbor and select Navy pier site and harbor locations. All right, so under, under the MIT, um, the National Marine uh, Fishery Service authorized, uh, or it permitted, uh, under its permit, they, so every five years the Navy had to get a permit, and so the most recent permit authorized uh, in this area 12,580 detonations of various magnitudes per year for five years. And the MIT, uh, permit allowed eight, 81,962 takings of 26 different marine mammal species, including whales and dolphins, per year for five years. The permit also allowed damage or kill of over six square miles of endangered coral reefs, plus additional 20 square miles of coral reef around FDM through the use of bombs. So on February 2019, just recently, the Navy released its draft supplement to the 2015 MIT Environmental Impact Statement. And this is to support its uh, need to seek permits to extend beyond 2020. So for another additional, hopefully, five more years, I think is what they're aiming for. The draft SEIS considers ongoing and future activities uh, training and testing at sea and on FDM, updated training and testing requirements, new information from an updated acoustic effects model, it updates marine mammal density data, and incorporates evolving and emergent best available science. The Navy will seek the issuance of federal regulatory permits and authorizations under the Marine Mammal Protection Act and Endangered Species Act to support these activities beyond 2020. This is, this is just one of the maps from the, the MIT SEIS, the, impact, the Environmental Impact Statement. And what it shows here, so all, all of the, the arrows and the words uh, kind of are locations of training on the land on Guam. So we know that it also includes water, but these are just certain ones just for sample purposes. I'm gonna read what they are. One is, uh, so starting up, on, yeah, north, and, and going uh, to the left of the screen, we'll go left. It's Paddy Point Combat Arms Training Maintenance Range, Small Arms. And then past Retidian Point, it's Finnegodson Small Arms Range, near Tengisen. Uh, PD Floating Mine Neutralization Site, down south, down. There, PD. PD Floating Mine Neutralization Site, and then there's the out, Outer Apra Harbor Underwater Detonation Site, Arodi Point Small Arms Range, Agate Bay Mine Neutralization Site. And the furthest one down there is called Small Boat Small Arms Range Firing Area. These are, these are just the areas closest to the landmass of Guam. And of course there are maps for all the other islands, but this is, Apra, this is a close-up of Upper Harbor complex, and in, in Upper Harbor there are others such as, well they are there, I'll, I'll just let you look at that for a little while. So those, um, it shows there the, the um, where in the harbor that 
that one detonation site is. And then it shows the safety area, see on the bottom left there, it's the roadie, um, it's like the safety zone so that light green dotted lines are the, the safety, safety areas. And the, the red dotted lines would be the, the um, danger areas. That's for the Arodi Point Small Arms Range. Okay, next screen, please. Next slide. All right, so this is the island of Guam. And, and just for Guam, so these, these show some of the other uh, sites that they are referring to. Um, they also point to, to on land. But I, if you notice, okay, so right before the big triangle coming up from the left, uh, right outside that, that marked area are Santa Rosa Bank and Galvez Banks. There you go. All right. Thank you. So this, this um, MIT training area, I mean, or the study of the MIT training area does not include any discussion on the, the Retidian Light Fire Training Range. Those are in another, another um, SEIS, and, and so in the military's discussions, they are separate. So I just wanted to make sure, because I know that we've had other hearings regarding this Retidian Firing Range, and to be sure. Okay. Uh, thank you, Senator Chalahi. Uh, so, uh, this part of the agenda, we would like to ask uh, BSP, uh, Coastal Zone Management, uh, to um, present, uh, provide testimony, and I believe they have a presentation. Good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, at, the, at the outset, I want to thank... Um, uh, I want to thank uh, uh, Senator Perez and Senator Lai for the opportunity for the Bureau to testify before the committee on this subject. Uh, the Bureau had been in the process of or or orchestrating a, uh, organizing a similar uh, presentation that the Governor's Office coordinating for Speaker Barnes' Military Bureau Committee um, later uh, on in the subsequent future. Uh, however, the Military Bureau is one of those subjects that does not suffer from too much attention. So we're very grateful for the opportunity. There is a presentation that's been developed uh, by Edwin Rages from the Coastal Zone Management Program uh, next to me here. But before we do that, I wanted to sort of uh, briefly explain uh, the Bureau's role in this matter here. Uh, the Bureau has a mandate on the Coastal Zone Management Protection Act to review federal activities to see if they are consistent with existing federal law and their impacts upon the coastal zone, which is essentially the entire island of Guam. Uh, this would involve reviews as to its applicability to um, the uh, National Environmental Protection Act, the Clean Water Act, the Mountain Protection Act, uh, and even the Rivers and Harbors Act as well, and uh, not just to name a few here. So in, in saying this, just I want to explain at the beginning that what the Bureau does is actually a, in reviewing these matters, is actually a technical determination. It's not a policy determination. Uh, in that respect, we defer to the elected leadership of the island, of course, the governor, lieutenant governor, and members of this august body. Our, our job is to review uh, the voluminous documents and provide the information for you as policymakers to make the best informed decision on these matters. Um, in this respect, our, our, our role here is every, every, uh, very much involved in the actual permitting process for these activities. Uh, that part process is called federal consistency review. Um, in this respect, then, uh, we have uh, big, actually begun uh, to look at that process, um, even looking at the voluminous 3,000-page EIS. I should, though, note, though, the actual formal federal consistency review uh, has not begun yet. That will begin when the applications for permits are actually uh, put in. Yes, uh, they have announced, released the EIS. Yes, they announced for public comments. But the Bureau's formal role in the permitting process begins when they actually send in the permits, which we expect in the next couple months. Uh, be that as it may, uh, Governor Leangro has directed the Bureau and other agencies to take a proactive approach to uh, military uh, build-up activities, and so we have begun our review of the EIS. Um, we have not yet completed, as again, 3,000 pages, but we expect to do it sometime in the next 60 to 90 days. Um, for the moment, though, at this opportunity, we would like to present our, at least our preliminary findings 
and sort of identify the key areas, some of which um, Senator Lahi has outlined in, in her presentation, that which the Bureau will be examining over the, um, over the next uh, 60 days here. And so in that respect, I'll defer to Edwin here to begin the presentation. Hoffman, good afternoon. If I can get my presentation up, please. Thank you very much. Um, as my director said, my name is Edwin Regis. I'm the administrator for the Guam Coastal Management Program. And I have to point out that this presentation does not constitute a consultation of Guam CZM program under the terms of the Coastal Zone Management Act. Next slide, please. So our understanding of the, pro the proposed action is that there's at sea testing and tra uh, training and testing to support military readiness to be successful at warfare. And that warfare is further defined as air, amphibious, surface, anti-sub, mine strike, electronic, expeditionary warfare. Testing evaluation and maintenance of missiles, torpedoes, radar, and active passive sonar and vessels will also be extended to new air surface and underwater and weapon systems that uh, are integrated into the fleet. The effects that we'll be looking at specifically are effects uh, of uh, sonar, explosives, transit, uh, and, and the mere presence of, of uh, military uh, vessels. Next slide, please. So the ESA, the Endangered Species Act and, and Marine, Protect, uh, Marine Mammals Protection Act, EIS resource areas are broken up into these following uh, different criteria, uh, different sections. And so we'll be looking at um, major impact considerations. And so one of the, the areas will be on the notion of take. And this is what they're getting, that's what, this is what they're seeking the permit for. And so take is defined as to harass, hunt, capture, or kill, or attempt to hunt harass, capture, or kill any marine mammal. Um, and so we'll be looking at how that would affect, right, because there is uh, impacts, clearly, but the challenge that we'll be working with the, uh, our partners is to assess how that would affect um, species populations or if there's change in disturbance in, in these species breeding, breeding, uh, breeding patterns or, or other, other activities that would disrupt their normal uh, well-being of, of, the, of the species. Um, what I would l want to also suggest um, to note is that this process or the outcome is a discussion. A discussion is, it's going to be a discussion on mitigation or project adjustments. So this is an engagement process where we can understand the project fully, but then also work to ensure that the resources of, of the territory are, uh, are protected. Next slide, please. So the initial concepts that we'll be looking at, um, just by reading the executive summary, um, one of them is marine habitats, and we want to ensure that military expended material will not pose contamination threats as material breaks down. This is not only a direct impact as the uh, detonation occurs, but any particles that may be consumed by organ or organisms that can affect the food chain. So we're not looking at just the moment, but what could happen after the activity takes place. We are concerned about any kind of seafloor detonations within our coastal zone, uh, and this doesn't matter if, it's, if there's no corals on hard bottom uh, or substrates with or without the presence of coral. We know that the hard bottom substrate is an important uh, area where coral polyps can settle, and we want to be sure that that uh, habitat is protected. Marine mammals, sonar, we know that they're linked to mortality, and one of the concerns that we'll be looking at is well groundings and how the, uh, the ability for the government to respond to that and what kind of impacts that would uh, have on our resources and the um, overall effects that could have, let's say, if a, if a well grounded up uh, in, in Tumon Bay, for example. I mean, obviously, we can't leave that. We'd have to respond to it because there would be numerous environmental concerns uh, and issues that would result from that, such as noxious odors, uh, excessive nutrients, um, just, to, just to name a few. Next slide, please. Um, they do mention that sea turtles would be adversely affected. We want to really look at and see how that uh, is, um, or what the data surrounding that is, entails. Marine invertebrates, corals. Um, we do know that there was a, uh, while the ESA, um, the EIS doesn't list it as a direct impact, but we want to be sure that we look at strikes as a consideration. As you know, we did have a, a ship that grounded on Jade Shoals in June 2017, which uh, damaged a very pristine uh, coral aggregation. 
Social economics is another social economic resources. We want to look at public access to determine location and nearshore use. Um, to, to ensure that there is no disruption of public access and the free-flowing nature of our coastal shores. To end the presentation, last slide please. Here's our timeline and as my director said that the, the federal consistency process has not started and, and so you see the arrow where it says we are here. If the DOD wants to meet this timeline, there's two actions that they would need to comply with. One is the actual federal action which this, this uh, the MIT is, uh, engage, is uh, represents and that has to be done 60 days before prior to the rod is issued. So if they want to meet this timeline, they would need to engage us March 2020. Uh, under 15 CFR subpart D, which is the National Marine Fisheries Service permit that they're requesting, that is a listed permit. So uh, NIMS has to submit federal consisting to the Bureau of Planning six months prior to the issuance of the take permit. And, and so then we anticipate that start in January 2020. Um, the deeper dive will happen when these, these uh, federal consistency application does is transmitted to the Bureau for its review. And at that time, we look forward to working with the various uh, subject matter experts and technical expert, uh, tech, techno experts to look at the different activities and to determine the effects on uh, our enforceable policies. Thank you, that's my presentation. And if I might add, um, again, this is a process driven by the data and the evidence and the facts. And the Bureau's job is to examine all aspects of this proposal here and let the facts and the data and the evidence speak for themselves. And then from that, uh, hopefully arrive at a, a conclusion or a position the, the community can unite behind, but more important to resolve some of the concerns that may arise as a consequence of the Bureau's review. Uh, that concludes our presentation, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, uh, Director Titano and Edwin Regis. Um, if you can stand by for questions later, sure. uh, we'll ask um, the other agencies to come and pre present their testimony as well. So, next on our list is Guam Environmental Protection Agency. If we can have uh, Administrator Walter Leon Guerrero and, and any of its staff. Uh, thank you. Thank you for being here. I know you just got in today, right? <laughs> If you could introduce yourself too, thank you. Good afternoon. Um, sorry, I'm not really prepared. Uh, I just came in this weekend uh, from almost a two weeks uh, uh, working meetings with uh, in Hawaii. I have to my right, Mr. Jesse Cruz, who was the acting that took care of a lot of the requests for this committee. Um, myself, I'm Walter S. Leongaro, the administrator for Guam EPA and um, We've come prepared to explain our process in, in the MIT review. First and foremost, Guam EPA is limited by the regulatory authority that we currently have. I know that there were questions about um, some of the permits that may have been issued, and a lot of that was pertaining to maybe underwater detonations. And at this point, Guam EPA does not have authority to do that. With that being said, I'm going to read what we have that we've provided to the this council for the committee, which includes our letter of comments that we submitted to the governor for the MIT, as well as a list of permits that we have issued uh, during the, next, the last couple of years for DOD. Uh, but I don't think it's really what you guys were requesting from us. I wanted to put that out there to understand. Um, most of the comments that we have submitted to the governor came from Mr. Jesse Cruz's uh, group, the, the monitoring group, which oversees a lot of the water recommendations that Guam EPA can provide. Again, unfortunately, we're still working on developing some statutes to go before this legislative so that uh, Mr. Cruz and his EMAS division will have more regulatory authority and not just recommended uh, uh, opinions that he can provide that we can push forward. Uh, so let me read my opening statement and then for questions about the actual comments that we've provided, Mr. Cruz can, can assist. So during the review of the 2019 MIT Supplemental, the agency limited its comments activities in areas that fall within our regulatory oversight. MIT's central core are the activities itself. The vast majority of activities occur in on existing ranges out, out at sea beyond our territorial waters or in other jurisdictions. It is our understanding that these activities will have minimal environmental or construction related impacts. 
The majority of the agency's concerns are listed in our written comments to the governor, which we're submitting as attachment A. The agency shall require that all projects and actions associated with the MIT conform and follow all locally established review, review permitting, and enforcement process. As the primary local environmental regulatory authority, the agency will be inspecting, monitoring, and reviewing all projects for compliance to all local and federal environmental laws and regulations. If regulatory requirements are not met, then appropriate actions will be required before the projects will proceed. Again, attachment B of our submittal is the permits issued for all Department of Defense within the last seven years. I would like to add that um, this week we also have um, Mr. Carl Goldstein and Mr. John McCarroll, who oversees the Pacific Island Office for US EPA Region 9. And Carl Goldstein is our Guam Program Manager. I, we had a discussion today about this committee. He wants to see our comments, and he said that if there's things that he can have, assist us to assist Guam in moving forward, they have our, we have their commitment. And with that, I'm going to pass it on to Jesse to maybe go over just some generalities of the actual comments that we submitted to the governor. Jesse? Good afternoon. Um, as you can see in attachment A, it was our letter to the governor. Um, the majority of our comments centered around, <clears throat> like Walter, um, the administrator, was talking about how the Navy did a substantial job of un of <clears throat> listing the activities, but one of our major concerns were that they weren't publicly noticing or after action reports on any activities. So that was one of the major um, deficiencies that we saw was that, yes, we do this, the MIT in the beginning and we do all this pre-consultation everything, but once the um, activities actually occur, there was no feedback loop for us to see if there was how much marine debris was collected, if there was, uh, incidental take or a fish kill or anything along those lines. And so those were kind of where our comments were associated with. <clears throat> and Jesse Scoop okay. yeah. also uh, in the comments also pointed out why the need for the military to increase their the, the detonations from a 10 pound to a 20 pound, which would cause more concussion underwater. So there, there there's, we could go into detail. I don't, I'm not sure if that's exactly what this committee wants. We haven't submitted it. Um, if you do want to go into detail, again, um, I have Jesse Cruz who put the majority of these comments together. I also have Kachita Titano who runs our Air Land Division. I have Michelle Lestimosa who runs our Green Parcel Desmoa Division. Um, and Nick uh, Rupley Lee who is our PIO but was often our, my acting deputy director last year. So we will be here for any questions that you want to ask specific, on specifics on. Um, if, if the committee wants to require us to read our comments and then we can ask questions later, please direct us so. Well, if, if, if you don't mind, Mr. Cruz, yes, I would, or Mr. Leongra, I would like that because of the goal of the hearing is for the public to hear some of our, our agencies, our experts, and what their comments are so that it's to inform us so how so we can formulate our our response also but also the public because their deadline for comments is coming up and this might help them it might give them more um i appreciate the just, opportunity yes. senator and i again we're here to to try yes. to help you guys help us help the community and i agree with you so it's very helpful for the military to report afterward what the actual impact might have been and and same thing with uh, our agencies we'd like to hear from you what your expertise is saying thank you okay. <clears throat> so comment number two was in the past pre-coordination meetings on these activities were conducted with local regulatory agencies guam epa requests that these meetings standard these these Guam EPA requests to make these meetings standard operating procedures at a minimum of a biannual basis. At a minimum, a yearly report should be produced summarizing all activities identified in the MIT. There is no current mechanism to evaluate if these activities and quantities identified in the MIT are exceeded or met. Reports should address any impacts, or st to, impacts to stressors. Neither the 2015 MIT or the 2019 supplemental MIT have a discussion on the rationale 
for an increase from the 10 pound underwater mine charge to the new standard of a 20 pound charge for the listed mine detonation activities. In the 2015 MIT, it states that amphibious salts and raids sediment plumes are temporary and since no military materials are expended, no further analysis of this training activity is provided. But in previous assaults on Guam, it has been observed that physical damages, corals have been crushed or turned over from these activities have occurred. <clears throat> Neither the 2015 MIT nor the 2019 supplemental MIT have a discussion in the cumulative impact section that describes the total cumulative impacts that the individual activities impact would have on the environment. For instance, the 2015 MIT states that the impact from two vessel sinkings a year are minimal, but there is no discussion on what the impact would be for a, a five-year period where a total of 10 vessels would be sunk. The document continues to state that for preferred alternative, 237 tons of metal would be released into the MIT range complex. This is a 1.3% increase over the no action alternative. Expand this out over a five-year period, this would equate to a 6.5 increase or 1,185 tons of metal. At one point does this become significant? There really is no temporal discussion on the additive impact of any stressors to the environment. In the 2019 MIT supplement, section 3.1.2.4, other materials explains that detonations, explosions, and other activities may result in dispersion of glass, carbon fibers, plastics, rubber, steel, iron, concrete, etc. There is no discussion in any effort to clean up the marine debris as a result of MIT activities or after MIT activities are completed. There needs to be discussion on this topic. The 2019 supplemental MIT in section 3.1.3 public scoping comments states that Guam does not maintain screening standards for metals in sediments of in metals and sediments of water and sites you US EPA thresholds. <clears throat> we reference to suggest parameters for bulk sediment analysis under our permit requirements under Section 401 Water Quality Certification. Gotta fix that. The 2019 MIT Supplement Section 5.1.2.2.1.1 Adaptive Management states that the man adaptive management process is to help the Navy have better knowledge on ecological systems. The process involves technical review meetings and ongoing discussions between the Navy, National Marine Fisheries Service, the Marine Mammal Commission, and other experts in the scientific community. This process makes no mentions of local stakeholders or other local natural resources managers like Guam EPA, Department of Agriculture, Bureau of Statistics and Plans, etc. This section should be revised to include that all local agencies and departments. In the 2019 Supplemental MIT, the Section 5.2.2.3, Incident Reports states that the Navy will submit annual reports to the National Marine Fishery Service that include any incidents that may affect shallow water coral reefs. They will also be forwarding, reporting on any effects to Endangered Species Act listed, listed species. They did not uh, do these ESA listed species include the new ESA listed corals? There needs to be a further discussion on this topic. Any and all construction that is related to either the 2015 MIT or the 2019 supplemental MIT must be permitted by the Guam Environmental Protection Agency and must therefore meet all relevant requirements of Guam EPA regulations. And these include but are not limited to a list of our regulatory standards. The 2015 or 2019 MIT supplemental states that there have been no new information since the 2015 MIT, which identifies specific, specific data gaps within the report about the environmental impact of previously used ammunition or the degradation products on the marine environment. There needs to be further discussions on that topic. Um, thank you. So, if I'm correct. So we don't have a report card as to the impacts, cumulative impacts that have happened so far. No, no, ma'am. We haven't. The agency has not seen one since uh, the 2015 MIT or anything to, like to that effect. And any prior MIT. Or any prior MIT, Yes. Yeah. 
So we're not sure if they were submitting to the, local, the federal agencies, but the local agencies have not been included in that feedback loop. Okay. Can I just ask you, so attached to your test or your letter to the governor was a, a list of permits, or no, this is attached to the letter to me. Uh, thank you. Uh, a list of permits. So in your permitting process, are you able to, to get the information that you've specified today? By the way, I appreciate your list. It, it <clears throat> no, no ma'am, the, the list, Guam EPA doesn't track our, um, our projects that way. These are individual construction projects that are not specifically related to the mid or just all military projects on the island since um, 2012. And so we do not have a, a mechanism to track that now. But I could add to that, that um, when we found this gap as recently as this past week, that is something that um, we will be working with our permit team to include uh, in our electronic database that we're developing to ensure that we can multi-track on multi-different levels, much like an Excel spreadsheet. Once you highlight that, you can see what's going on. So we're working on that. Um, I do, and, I, and from what I gather and listening to some of the, the information you guys have provided today, I, I think some of the permits that you guys were really looking at was the you know, open detonation. So we have the authority under the Airland Division to give OBOD permits on land, but we don't have that same authority in the marine environment. So that is also a, maybe a regulatory gap that we could be meeting with uh, our oversight senator Paris about as far as developing, helping develop our, and move forward as far as giving us the proper regulatory authority and something that um, this was brought to light um, outside of the other data, data authority gaps that we have that we'll be looking to try to improve our agency response and regulatory oversight. Thank you. Yes, I, I do look forward to working with you on that. Um, on another topic, uh, it says that we do, not have, we do not have any standards for metals and sediments of water. Um, I understand that you are updating your, the, the regulations. Um, will that address that lack, that app? Yeah, we're, um, Guam EPA is currently going through a, a revision of our Guam water quality standards, and these are part of the can, range of parameters that we're looking at trying to update. So, but we're still looking to see if um, the chemical constituents in the munitions of environmental concern or the ammunition is if there are US EPA equivalent standards or not. So if they are, we will be trying to adopt them this year, yes. So just, just so you uh, there's a complete understand, we have uh, technical guidelines that allow us for our water and, and soil uh, regulated or screening levels. And they're actually called the Pacific Basin environmental or screening uh, environmental screening levels that we use. It, it, has not, it has not at this point been developed to the sediment, but as Jesse pointed out, that's something that we're looking to do now to see if there's corresponding guidance that US EPA could provide us that we would incorporate into our water quality, as far as uh, updating our statutes and regulations. So the answer is yes, Senator. We hope to include those in our updates uh, so that uh, we are better suited to manage and regulate the environment both on land and marine side. Yeah, so um, we're gonna move on, but if you can stay for more questions, I, I appreciate that. All right. Um, the State Historic Preservation Officer was not able to attend today. She's not feeling well, but I wanted to, um, from the MIT documents, we, we just pulled up the cultural resources that they list. So there's a long list uh, of cultural resources that may be impacted. And um, uh, wait, it's hard to see. But her general comment on this was that her concern was that the list 
does not fully incorporate all the cultural resources that may be impacted. But um, uh, are we able to make that bigger? Or is All right, so there are approximately, it's a spreadsheet in, in the document itself and uh, where they list the types of historic properties or resources that are affected. And so these are some examples in the harbor to submerge historic resources. They say historic sites there, sorry. Um, thanks, yeah, Naval Base. Uh, fuel, is it? Uh, Echo Fuel Pier, Sasa Valley Tank Farm, Tenjo Vista Tank Farm. I'm just going to read the areas. And, and, so, and, and in general, there are very brief descriptions of these resources, including like pre-contact rock shelters, petroglyphs, historic forts, steps, and well complex. 16 pre-contact sites, 9 multi-component sites, 55 ar historic archaeological sites. Now I'm reading about this one, uh, where they grouped this one location to be Naval Base Guam, Polaris Point, Upper Harbor, Delta Echo Field Piers, and the tank farms. Okay, and then, so on the next page again, they describe other ones. So on the Naval Base Guam munitions site, two cave and rock shelter complexes, Laddie Period, a Chamorro Massacre site, Fena, um, 263 pre-contact sites. This is, so these are again our, uh, you can go to the next page. These are the military's listing of historic sites that may be impacted. You can just blow it up on each page and then go to the next page. So again, these are the land pretty much the land except for those two submerged sites or resources that they discussed at, at the very beginning. The rest are all land sites. Paddy Point, Taragi Beach Historic District, um, World War II Airfield, Cold War Era Airfield, one historic archeological sites on Naval Base Telecommunications. They talk about on Anderson, so, so they give some detail, but again, so the ship was general concern and as she is supposed to address this with them is uh, that she, it's her, their office's uh, assertion that not, or concern that not all the cultural or historic sites are, are listed here. Um, I would like to invite the uh, Guam Historic Preservation Review Committee members, if they are here to, if they have any comment that they would like to. Or Joe, Joe from the Guam Preservation Trust, please. Joe, if you could begin, I know that you, you also have been looking at these and, and providing input on the previous uh, SEIS. Is there any input that the GPT may be providing? Uh, for the record, my name is Joe Kinata, Chief Program Officer of the Guam Preservation Trust. And uh, <clears throat> to answer your question, um, Senator, uh, We've been involved, and in also your office and, and Senator Mars's office have been involved, and Senator uh, Paris uh, have been involved uh, in January on the, the uh, consultation meetings. Um, and uh, I know that the, the SHPO actually is the lead agency in overseeing all of this. The Guam Preservation Trust also uh, gives recommendation. Uh, we are not, uh, uh, we are just a concurring party and we, uh, we provide that recommendation as needed. Uh, I know that in January 22nd, there have been uh, several inputs by the, by the audience and as, as well as Guam Preservation Trust. Um, and I know that was discussed earlier about cumulative, uh, cumulative uh, impacts that need to be looked in. 
uh, more frequent meetings with the SHPO, uh, I, I believe, because communication breakdown on, on that end. And then we talked earlier about report cards. And I believe the report card that they're talking about will be submitted according to their March 12 meeting. Uh, they're looking at uh, report card being submitted in June. Report card for the last 10 years, they're looking at submitting it in, in June of this year. So I'm not too sure if we, anybody ever got that information. Um, the other concern really is uh, uh, clearly defined assurances to make sure mitigation measures are being followed. Uh, we've already had uh, some examples of that, that that needed to be uh, reviewed again and develop more proactive measures to ensure no adverse actions on historic properties, uh, such as the making some amendments to section five, the field monitoring and report submission in the 2009 Merck uh, programmatic agreement, um, such as digital photographs before and after training exercises. Uh, in the Merck, they only showed it after, but we need to have we need to, for them to go in and, and give some photographs before and then after the training exercises. And the condition assessment report for each historic property for the last 10 years, of which they responded that they will, they will submit that in in June of this year. And Senator, that's all I have to report. Do you agree with the... Um suggestion by the SHPO that there, the list is, does not um, address all potential historic properties within the training and testing area? Yes, um, we, we did got some uh, response from the military that uh, there are no historic properties affected, but when you look at, when you look, and it's, it's mainly on, on natural resources, which is out on, on the ocean, uh, but where it starts is at the coastal, le uh, the coastal area of which um, the SHPO had listed all of these sites there. So I do believe that there are some sites, there's some oversight on, on the listing of sites uh, and that we need to go back again and, and provide that list to uh, the military. But I do believe that there is, uh, there is an oversight on that. Thank you. Um, when I was going through those slides earlier, uh, I, I failed to read the summary. So this is a quote from the current EIS that kind of summarizes then the, this is from, so in 2015 they listed these out and so they say there are no additional in our 2020 MIT or 2019 MIT uh, SEIS, there are no additional properties. But in 2015, uh, the training constraints map identifies 13 no training areas, eight on Guam and five on Tinian, and 35 limited training areas, 20 on Guam and 15 on Tinian, refined from the previous military operations area constraints map boundaries. Limited training areas are defined as pedestrian traffic areas with vehicular access limited to designated roadways and or the usage of rubber tired vehicles. No pyro Techniques, demolition, or digging is allowed without prior consultation with the Historic Preservation Office. Over 540 cultural resources associated with, the Guam, with Guam are considered eligible for or listed in the National Re Register of Historic Places, including eight individual resources listed in the National Historic, uh, I mean, National Registry of Historic Places, six listed in the Guam Register of Historic Places only, and 348 pre-contact sites 36 multi-component sites, 117 historic archaeological sites, 18 buildings, and 66 structures. So that's from one of the, the summaries of the impacts in 2015. All right. Mr. Mr. Lotz, would you like to add to this? Uh, thank you. I, uh, <clears throat> I'm Dave Lotz. I'm the vice chairman for the Guam Review Board for Historic Preservation and vice chairman for the Board for Guam Preservation Trust. Uh, Joe has already indicated the present Guam Preservation Trust participation. I do want to make some, some comments uh, germane to this. First of all, 
the MIT supplemental EIS is not identical to the Navy's request for a Section 106 programmatic agreement by the end of this year. The supplemental, as our slides have shown, are principally for activities out in the ocean. The Section 106 is for the entire MIT. So I think we have to, the point I want to make is, is there is a clear distinction on that. Uh, one of my concerns about the MIT is it just said, the Navy just says they have to do it, but they really don't demonstrate a, the fundamental need for this. And I think it's important that they should demonstrate the need other than just say we have to do training. I do commend the legislature for coordinating this because I think Guam needs to make a more aggressive approach dealing with the military and we should not be uh, in any ways passive. I think there's some considerable uh, gaps in this. Could we go back to the Guam map? I would like to point out a few things on that, please. The map that shows the training areas? That's right, just the Guam map. All right, well, thank you. Uh, again, this, as I understand it, am I correct, this is a military map? And as I also understand it, it is only for the supplemental EIS. So it's not for the entire MIT. Therefore, you're going to see places the military conducts training currently and in the future under the MIT not identified. Uh, prominently is, is Anderson South and also the Naval Magazine. I also want to mention in the offshore areas, there are protected areas that are not identified on this map and should not be available for training. This includes the five uh, Guam Marine Preserves. It includes two ecological reserves of the Navy, and it includes two offshore areas of the War in the Pacific National Historical Park. Um, relative to the submerged cultural resources, the EIS made a passive statement that there are no additional resources known, so they've made no effort to conduct additional cultural resource surveys and, and not even document uh, research. There is cultural resources in these submerged waters and a minimal era effort to research what is in print would produce that information. Uh, there are resources off of particularly the Aga Beach I'm familiar with. I've not actually seen them, but I have documentation that's been there. And there are also all those off of the entrance to Apra Harbor. So I think we should just not accept that. Likewise, I am not certain as to how current the listing that you provided, which I presume is a Navy listing, mainly because the Navy has conducted extensive cultural resource surveys in the last, oh, several years in relation to the military buildup that has clearly identified uh, numerous cultural resources. The, the thing that I, in relative to the overall MIT, is the wealth of cultural resources, particularly in the Naval Magazine area. And I have a drawing map from the, this is from the uh, draft Natural Resources Management Plan of, I believe, November of last year. And it clearly shows <laughs> numerous types of training in the Alamogosa area of the Naval Magazine. And I cannot think anything other that those are gonna have an adverse impact on those cultural resources. And I do believe uh, we should, uh, in relation to er er efforts in addition, particularly the 106, I think we should come up with our own proposal to preserve those. I've actually uh, began to develop a proposal that that area within federal lands of the magazine at, at 
Alamogosa and Meppo should really be declared a national monument. And I should be finished with that shortly and be providing it to the legislature. But that is more in regard to the section 106. And when I hear people talk about the MIT programmatic agreement, I think if we quickly accept the programmatic agreement approach, that is not to our advantage. Our advantage is to tactfully negotiate through the 106 process, li listing all the cultural resources that are to be impacted, understanding the effects and adverse impacts. Because if we quickly agree to a programmatic agreement, that satisfies the Navy's needs, does not necessarily protect our cultural resources. Uh, just an example that is current that I want to identify as far as things are not cl always clearly identified. The Navy's been issuing several programmatic agreements. This is a programmatic agreement of 11. And for example, there's one under review right now. It's called P608 dealing with earth-covered magazines at the Naval Magazine. Uh, the Navy, unfortunately, does not make all the cultural resource information available to whose heritage those sites belong to, the people of Guam. But in particular, doing some research at the SHPO office, uh, again, not identified, it would destroy one laddie site within the Naval Magazine. So I think we have to be diligent and we have to uh, ask very pointed questions and do our own research in order to satisfy our, what we need to protect. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lotz. That's exactly what we're trying to do here is do our research and through your help and the help of the experts in these agencies, that's, we're really hoping to do that. So thank you both for your, for your help. Yes, thank you so much. Um, we would like to invite the other agencies to come to the table. If you guys can, the rest of the ages, agencies can wait uh, a little bit longer for other questions later on. Uh, so uh, I believe Department of Agriculture, uh, Guam Water Works Authority, uh, and also Guam Solid Waste Authority is here. Of day, Madam Chair. Um, my name is John Sibora, for the record, and that I am representing the uh, director who is currently off island, Ms. Muna Breck. And so, on behalf of her, I am here with my experts from the department, from the Aquatic and Wildlife Division, so that they can have a little review as well as uh, uh, input into the MIT. Thank you. Half a day, uh, Senators. Uh, for the record, my name is Celestino Algun. I am the uh, Chief of the Division of Aquatic and Wildlife Resources. Uh, I have a few uh, opening remarks and I'll, if I'll, uh, I'll read it. Half a day, Senators of the Guam Legislature. The Division of Aquatic and Wildlife Resources submits comments, has submitted comments to the Marianas Information Training and Technology, also known as the MIT. The, the department is concerned that most of the actions included, thank you, included in the MIT is with clear, it is, is not with clear direction of how the natural resources are to be dealt with in the proposed actions. So there's much to be discussed as far as that is concerned. The Division of Aquatic and Wildlife Resources deals with these issues of the base access, and that needs to be actually worked out. In, in our constant, uh, much of what we do as natural resource agency in monitoring the actions within the base, we have constantly dealt with issues of just entering the base. Not much the issues now 
in, in the proposed action and how to monitor that action. So there's mu much to be dealt with and many challenges to be uh, dealt with as well. As much as the activity of the, I'm oh, sorry, uh, must be clear and dealt with, the animals that are negatively impacted by the action must also be, uh, be determined. The division has recorded many well strandings uh, of mammals. And I think that's, uh, earlier we had mentioned well strandings. We have to understand well strandings are an after the fact event. What we don't understand is to what extent is the military ac activity, submarine soundings as, as far as that goes, to what extent do those things impact the marine mammals that are part of our environment? We actually have well stranding. I think uh, Brent can actually, to my far left, uh, can actually comment on that. We've actually seen an increase, but to what degree does that reflect the impact, the military action, and, and, and subsequently, to what extent does the MIT, will, to what extent will the MIT actually impact those strandings as well? Uh, just, just in closing, I'd just like to say thank you very much for, for providing this opportunity, and uh, we welcome the, uh, the questions that you may have in that regard. Thank you. What I'd like to also uh, mention, we actually submitted comments way in advance. Uh, I think, uh, I'm not sure if it's available here. We actually had submitted it to the governor for, for comments. It's actually an 11-page document that we have summarized everything and we put it in a spreadsheet and all. And I think uh, what we want to do is make sure that your committee has, has that copy as well. Uh, that way you're actually uh, well uh, um, informed as far as what our comments were. We did quite a bit of, uh, we provided much comments. Again, uh, we're very concerned of the actions of this current proposal in the MIT, but what we want to do is also find, uh, be aware of what are all the other proposed actions. It was mentioned previously, the, the, the basic, basic, as far as envi environmental resource management is what is the impact of cumulative effects. That is always going to be the issue. And I think with the MIT and all the other actions that are that have been done and all the actions that are forthcoming, the impact is going to be cumulative effects. And that is the key question. To what degree does that happen? And unfortunately, I believe the impact to our marine resources is, is already there. And that, that is actually happening in, in that regard. Thank you. Um, thank you, Tino. Um, if we can continue with the Department of Agriculture, uh, Brett Tibbetts. Uh, good afternoon and thank you, Senators. Uh, my name is Brent Tibbetts. I'm a biologist with the fisheries section of the Guam Department of Agriculture. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. It, uh, in reviewing the, uh, the EIS, there are several uh, portions of it that are uh, comment worthy, I guess I would say. One, of course, is the, uh, the potential to interact with marine mammals with the activities that we see uh, being proposed, sonar, uh, vessel interactions, uh, explosive detonation in the water. All of these have the potential to uh, impact marine mammals. One of the concerns from the EIS is that um, for all of the marine mammals that are mentioned, I don't think there's a single one that has the most current information available listed with it. We have information on strandings, on sightings, on uh, uh, whales sighted giving birth that were not mentioned in the EIS anywhere. And it, I, I, I'm, I'm not certain where the information was gotten from, but this is all information that was provided to our federal partners as well as that we have available. And it was not mentioned in the EIS. So just a concern for people maybe comments on the EIS that they don't have the most complete information available when their comments are being made. Uh, we do have uh, additional stranding records. We have, like I said, additional uh, records of uh, marine mammals identify giving birth in the region. One of particular concern is the mention of the uh, 
uh, agate offshore mine detonation site. That's almost precisely where we have uh, photographic evidence of sperm whales giving birth, with her, which are both uh, marine mammal and endangered species listed organisms. Uh, though it's not listed anywhere in the IS, that, uh, incidents like that. Um, another area of concern is uh, vessel strikes. Vessel strikes with marine mammals are addressed in the IS, but we have a, a greater incidence of vessel strikes with uh, sea turtles on uh, Guam. We've had at least five sea turtles uh, killed by vessel strike in the last seven years on Guam that we've been able to identify. And it, while it's difficult to identify the vessel that, that did strike the turtle, um, nearly all of these occurred in inner Upper Harbor, which is pretty much close to all activity except military vessel activity. So the implication is that it could be uh, military vessel strikes are causing the sea turtle mortality as well. Uh, another uh, area in the EIS is mentioned is the, the map of Guam that you showed had a large area to the, kind of the south, southeast of Guam, Whiskey 517. Uh, it is an area, as was mentioned, that is very closely related to uh, some offshore fishing banks where we've documented a fair amount of fishing activity. In the last two years, uh, those banks have been off limits about 120 days on average for the last two years, which is about a third of the year for uh, activity and primarily for fishing activity. Now, they do fall just outside the range uh, that is delimited, but we've had fishermen report that when they get down to the banks, there are military vessels there to telling them to not enter while activities are going on, even though they're outside the area. Um, one uh, type of mitigation that's been proposed in the past for this is, as uh, the military has mentioned, this is some sort of geographic mitigation. Possibly they move the boundary of the uh, Whiskey 517 a little bit further to the east to get it further away from these fishing areas and would lessen, certainly lessen the impact of the fishing uh, community on Guam. And uh, I might mention that most of the fishing community that does frequent the banks is non-commercial. This is just uh, subsistence recreational fishing and it's not commercial activity. So it's, it's, it's affecting the, uh, the local fishing community. Um, are your are your comments included in the twelve pages that Tino referred to earlier? Those may not be. I'm I'm putting comments together now, which we are going to be submitting either tomorrow or or by Wednesday morning. Uh, in addition to that. Oh, thank you very much. That's information that I'm I was never aware of, and it's very helpful. Yeah. Thank you. We'll be asking questions later, so I appreciate if you can stay on. Um, would you like to add to that? Anything else? Um, offhand, no. I'm a little, I've been a little nervous up here, so I don't, but it'd be easier to answer later on, probably. Okay, all right. Thank you, Brett. Um, if we can have um, Larry Gass from Guam Solid Waste Authority um, make comments about the impacts of the MIT. Thank you very much for inviting me here. Um, as far as the normal operations of solid waste, we should not have a major impact. If they increase testing, increase personnel, they'll increase waste, but that should be offset by increased revenue that would be charged to the military. We have a contract with them in place that says they will pay for disposal. The only thing I can see that may be a drawback is if we do have large marine mammals that have to be disposed of. Uh, our waste flow that comes in on a daily basis is not large enough to properly dispose of large organic carcasses. Um, that would be a major issue. Uh, but the normal waste stream would have no effect whatsoever. All right, thank you. Uh, and then if we, uh, the next person is uh, Vanjie Lujan from yeah. GWA. Thank you, I'm here representing Miguel Berdalio, our general manager. And like the rest of the conversation has been, this supplemental EIS really deals with the activities offshore. And so GWA, which we um, monitor and review these uh, activities for impacts to the Guam lens aquifer and to our discharge into the ocean, into our uh, Guam's waters, but this particular supplemental does not um, address that at all. 
So our, we basically don't have much comments on this particular document, but I would like to just add my own additional comments if that's okay. One of the things especially related to what all the agencies have problems in terms of identifying what cumulative impacts are is one we're not, we aren't very clear as to specifically what we're looking for. And I think it would be helpful if, if as an agency, we can be very specific. Uh, we, if we're gonna be looking at, I think for ma marine mammals, it's very clear. How many of these mammals are taped or even near taped, huh? that information, how, how over the period of 10 years? Because the first MIT was actually done in 2010, and so they've had this, where they've been in this, um, this activity for about nine years now, and we're not necessarily receiving input as to what exactly they're doing or the actual effects of those activities over the last nine years. So I think that as a government, we really need to be more specific about what is the parameters that we're saying we want to measure to see what the cumulative impact will be. So I think that that's just my personal feeling is that it's a little bit easier. I wanted to relate that to what GWA is doing in terms of addressing impacts on the northern Guam's lens. Uh, the other issue is that we don't have baseline data. So in 2010, what were the impacts? Uh, how many mammals were, how many wells were bleached? And all that. It's a little bit easier if you have data, which is very lacking in this particular document. Um, uh, we've been working with USGS and with the military on monitoring wells. And so for we have data for over close to 20 years. And so you can see the impact on those wells, uh, on the water quality in the northern aquifer based on these monitoring wells. And I think that that's what we as a government need to also do is try to figure out what the parameters are. And over a long period of time, if, if we need to partner with federal agencies or if we ourselves have to do it, is really have that data available. So for, for GWA, we're, as we are looking at the increase in the military populations on Guam and their activities, we are monitoring their effect through the what's happening within our water system through our wells and monitoring data. And so um, we are having an additional seven monitoring wells to really address that. And I think that using that model against what we're doing with the buildup, we need to have more of something concrete in terms of monitoring in order to, for us to have a a better conversation about what cumulative impact looks like. So that's just my comments. Have baseline data, and we, we probably need to start taking that now, and having parameters that we can then look at what we're looking at in terms of cumulative impact. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Is there anybody here that I missed that would like to testify? Okay, we can invite all the regulatory agencies that are here to come up to the table for uh, questions by my colleagues and myself. Um, yeah, feel free to stay. Yeah, yeah, don't leave. <laughs> so uh, if uh, BSP can also join the table too as well. Senator, can I can make a, can I make a comment based on oh. what the Guam Solid Waste Authority made? Sure. Yes. So, please. like during the original um, MERC when it was submitted, um, they kind of the, the military s separated the, the what they thought would impact Guam versus what they thought would impact CNMI. And when we reviewed it, we reviewed what what they submitted to us. Uh, a little bit later on, we realized that a lot of the the training that they were going the waste stream from those outer islands like in the CNMI, Tinian, Saipan, was scheduled to come to Guam. And we said, uh, by our policy, we will not accept any solid waste from any other location. So we took care of that. Um, we just need to make sure that, that they're not slipping that back in. So with all due respect, uh, in reference to what is generated on Guam in the training, may not have an impact. But if we were to start accepting other waste from the outer islands, uh, the, the CNMI, that may have an, ad, an additional impact because we really don't know, again, what the cumulative of all the waste together would be. Thank you. Do you want to ask questions first? Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask the uh, Department of Ag and 
um, BSP and anyone really, has any of you, do, does the National Marine Fishery Service consult you before they issue their permits to allow for the detonations or vice versa? Could I go? Uh, just, you know, uh, what, what I, I'm sure BSP does the same thing. We have partner agencies. So our partner agency in the federal side is the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. We also communicate with uh, NOAA uh, as well and the National Marine Fishery Service as well. So, and, and much in, during the, the uh, review period, we communicate our, our uh, uh, f uh, issues with whatever action is being proposed. And usually what we do as well is there's a little coordination, I think, in that regard, in which they, we kind of understand that we're small fry as far as the federal government is concerned. And so what we tend to do is try to look for our federal counterpart to, to push the issues or to emphasize the concerns on our side so that those are reflected in the action as far as whatever environmental impact statement is being proposed or e, uh, EIS or, or so forth. And so uh, in that regard, there is that degree of communication, I guess, that's going on between us and the federal, our federal count counterparts. So for a follow-up question, so one of the things regarding endangered species and threatened yes. species is um, reinitiation of the biological opinion. And so my question is, how did they come up with 81,962 takings of 26 different mammals per year for five years? What was the basis for that? And how do we, um, is there a need to actually reinitiate that biological opinion? Every time I see a take of any endangered species, I cringe. And uh, to tell you the truth, as far as that goes, I don't know where that number actually comes. I assume it's, it's, it's a, uh, uh, an analysis or a, an, an equation that incorporates the number of takes that's allowed per year and the potential in, incidents, incidences of which those actions will entail. Uh, that's as far as I go, as far as that number is. It's an astron astron astronomical number that defies any kind of logical explanation on my part, or our part, I guess. Uh, thank you. If, one thing they do mention in the EIS that a lot of the, the population information for marine mammals in this part of the world is lacking. And so they've, it, for some of that, they've done kind of conservative estimates of population densities based on areas where populations are known and corresponded that with the number of uh, actions they're going to be taking that have the potential to impact those mammals. Uh, they are right. A lot of the population information for those mammals is not known for this area, but there is some known, and they didn't reference that at all also. I think the numbers they've given are extremely conservative for their side. Like, I don't expect them to reach anywhere close to that number, but there is some information available to base some numbers on, and they, and they kind of seem to proceed as if there was absolutely no information available whatsoever. Senator, if, <clears throat> if I may, just to come back to uh, Edwin Ray, just Coastal Manager, and if I may just come back to uh, Senator Chalahi's question on, uh, on notification. So it's not the National Marine Fisheries Service that notice, notifies us of the uses of explo explosives based on the prior emit. It is the, the Department of Defense. So we receive public advisories that they're doing these specific activities, whether they're in Opera Harbor, Opera Harbor or other uh, designated areas on the island. To comment perhaps maybe on some clarification on the enforceable policy surrounding marine mammals is that the number of take uh, is restricted to zero. So our policy says that there shall be no take whatsoever of marine mammals. And I don't know if that can lead into discussion in terms of kind of the, um, the level of what's acceptable in NIM, uh, National Marine Fisheries Services and what's tolerable and acceptable within Guam, but certainly there's gonna be some conversation on the effect of that action and uh, our policy on marine, marine mammals. 
So you're saying there's, there's, there's a huge difference between what you're saying according to your policy you should accept versus what is being accepted according to the national permit. On, on a kind of a cursory view, it would be, um, we, we could assume that there is a disparity between their interpretation of impact and what's in our policy. The other, the question is about the sonar being used. Um, so there, there are cases where uh, Low-frequency active sonar uh, causes permanent damage, um, and in this in this SEIS, it talks about mid-frequency sonar. Are we confident that? Um, or first of all, are the Navy's plans to use active sonar in our waters? Are they uh, do, are they as stringent as in California and Hawaii? And to what extent are the impacts on our, our marine mammals and animals in relation to the use of the type of sonar that's being used in the MIT? I don't know if anybody can address that. Um, I can maybe address a little bit of that. Is that uh, it seems the, the mid-range sonar that's being proposed is the sonar that uh, the, the, the frequency of that that's used is the, the beaked whale's uh, most sensitive range for hearing as well. So it, it seems likely that they would have an impact. What that impact is, is very hard to determine, if any. Um, frequently when a, a whale comes up and is dead, um, the, a lot of the most biologically useful information is lost if it's been decomposing at all. We have to be extremely prompt to respond to those. And if I can say maybe this would be a one time is that currently our funding does not permit us to work on marine mammals as part of Department of Agriculture. So generally when we respond to these, it's just free time that we do this. We don't, we don't yeah, our volunteer time to do that. We don't, we don't have a grant that will fund for, for practically any work on marine mammals at all. And so it's, sometimes a challenge to get there as quickly as possible and get the useful yeah. information that can determine the cause of a uh, stranding. Uh, there, and again, I would mention that there are several strandings we've responded to in the last couple of years that were not mentioned in the EIS at all. And they, it's, well, it's very difficult to show a direct correlation. They have coincided quite closely with sonar use in, in the waters of Guam. And so it just, if, Getting the information to show a direct cause is, is very difficult to do, but um, it's made more difficult, I guess, by the lack of a, a funding mechanism to allow us to respond quickly. If I may, may Senators, uh, I think that's been my issue with a lot of this stuff. It's very anecdotal. We're just responding to an incident. As Brent had mentioned, a rail stranding, we're not, we're not funded to do ma marine mammals. Most, much of our funding comes from the sports fish restoration uh, funding mechanism, and that's you know paid through the, uh, the 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 program that we. And so, as Brent Brent had mentioned, it's it's very uh, it's on a volunteer basis. You know, when when they're you know you got to do it on your free time. We can't charge it to any particular uh, project or grant. Uh, but but the prop, the thing I always have with with much of this information, we're, we're getting information anecdotally. It's once in a while we have it. Okay, now it's, it's, we don't have any real indication of cause and effect. That's the problem we have a lot of with this stuff. And so what we do is we have uh, uh, an incident, we have a dead well, and oh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, some military vessel. That's all we know. And so we can make some uh, inferences, but that's really all they are, inferences. They're, they are not cause and effect as far as that goes. And so any statistician can look at our information and say, you don't have enough to, information to make any real conclusion in that regard. So that's the challenge, I think, on our end. Thank you. Um, I, so I have a 
a variety of things that I want to ask, but I wanted to jump in just at this point. Because we are looking at updating the PA, and there are many things that can be put into a programmatic agreement. So maybe one of the things that we can be doing is asking agencies like yourself recommendations as to what we can be putting in. I would like for us to be asking that they put something in to the programmatic agreement that allows us, either through them or through our agencies, to gather data like that. We shouldn't be just sitting here and, and um, so I'm not putting this on us, um, we, we shouldn't be sitting here trying to accommodate a developer and others who have asked something for us and not be able to be protecting and securing what are our resources. So I'm very glad that you brought that up and I really want us to be pushing for that to be in our programmatic agreement. Thank, thank you, Senator. I know Dave wants to say something as well. Um, I, I agree with you totally. What I believe strong heartily, these resources belong to Guam. It does not belong to the military, DOD, the Navy, it does not. The resources of this island belong to the people of Guam and therefore the, re the agencies that are, are tasked with that mission should be allowed the access to deal with uh, uh, if those resources are on military base. It should not be a problem. But unfortunately, the reality is it is a problem on our end. We have had issues as, uh, as far as access into, those, into the base as far as that goes. Uh, and so we would, we would like to see that, that that could be worked out. To me, it, it's just, to me, it's just the commander's slice, uh, what's the word, stroke of a pen. Let them in. That should work. Thank you. Um, so going, going back to the question about how, how a Department of Ag or a Division of Aquatic and Wildlife Resources, basically your purview is, is closer to shore versus out in the open ocean, right? So I guess I want to pass on that question to BSP. Uh, what kind of resources are available to address impacts to marine mammals that are beyond the near shore or do you have that purview? Well, if I understand your question, Senator, it's really a question of getting the actual data for it. And through the Federal Consistency Review, to the extent there are data gaps, uh, we can request them, the Navy, to provide the data to support their, their conclusions here. I should also comment in, in reference to you know, the, uh, what's acceptable in terms of takes here. I think one of the things we need to examine here is that what the Defense Department says is their plan to do and what is allowable under the actual permit they're applying are not always necessarily the same thing. Uh, some of the things we observe initially here is that when you take a look at, at their presentation of the MIT and with the level of the takes, for example, here, they're far below what the actual grant, uh, the, uh, the permit allows. And so those are sort of the issues in sort of need to refine. We're, we're sort of going to that same sort of um, situation with the examination for the Finnegadge and Small Arms. Uh, their assurances from the Defense Department or the, or the Navy that, well, we're not planning all these uh, activities here. But when you examine the actual permit they have pending for the Army Corps of Engineers, whether they plan or not, this is what's being allowed in the permit they're applying for. So these are sort of the issues you sort of uh, hopefully uh, try to resolve through the federal consistency process. I'd like to make a comment, if you don't mind, on, on the Senator's idea of, of uh, tying in marine mammals to a programmatic agreement now. This comes from the point of view that uh, federal statutes dealing with marine mammals is a completely different body of law as compared to uh, National Historic Preservation Act. Um, I like the idea, but I think you would find that you would have to demonstrate uh, the fact that marine mammals are a cultural resource uh, in order to make that linkage. And it would be worth at least exploring it as a traditional cultural property, but based upon my, my knowledge, I think it would be a real, a real challenge. It's a good idea, but I think it, it may not uh, pan out in the end. 
Well, I, I think that there are certain things that we can ask for. Um, and so certainly we can ask that they provide data or they provide some sort of funding source that allows us to be able to mitigate. So that was really more of what I was getting at is just um, hearing from the different agencies about what would allow them to actively be able to protect what we have. And um, with this agreement, have it be that, that vehicle that would allow us, since we're going to be streamlining the process for them and they are making certain demands upon our resources and our agencies, for them to be um, providing whatever the agencies might be able to ask for that would allow them to carry out their responsibilities and their ability to protect our resources. Uh, I, I certainly agree. I, I do want to add that there's no requirement for the Guam Historic Preservation Officer to enter into a programmatic agreement. To me, it's to the Navy's advantage because they could expedite their responsibilities under Section 106 and simply refer to a programmatic agreement. With no programmatic agreement, every training exercise in the jurisdiction of Guam has to go through a separate 106 process. I think we need to keep that in mind because if we quickly say, Oh, we like a programmatic agreement. You have, we've lost our bargaining power. We've completely lost it. So I say we have specific needs on cultural resources and related issues. Let's coordinate those and let's go through the process to get a clear understanding of what are our cultural resources. The list is incomplete and let's get a complete list of the of the impacts and then we can make a collaborative effort and say if the Navy wants a programmatic agreement then this is what Guam feels it's needed. If the Navy says no thanks we we can just walk away from that and the Navy would be burdened with additional work for every exercise uh, would be required for a 106. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Lance. I, I agree. And we are trying to do that um, with coordination with the, the SHPO's office, of course, all of the parties to the programmatic agreement, which is really not the subject of this hearing today, but it's important because it's, it's the process we are using for the National Historic Preservation, under the National Historic Preservation Act, to address historical property. So we are going to look at this and with a with the assistance of the governor's office and Senator Carlotta Leon Guerrero, her as the advisor, she's helping us to coordinate uh, what we are going, how we are going to negotiate that programmatic agreement. So yes, I agree. I just wanted to point out also for the agency. So I'm very much looking forward to to seeing your testimony. If you could share it with the public, I think that would be helpful to them. Anything that you can point out because you are really the keeper of these types of information for Guam, and I know that. Um, uh, we had a hearing like this, uh, I, I don't know if it's last year or the year before when they first came out with their scoping meetings and, and talking about doing the, another MIT uh, SEIS, or maybe it was a, with, when we had the draft, sorry, I can't remember, but I know we had a hearing and at that time we talked a lot about their reports. So they do issue annual reports. Part of those are unclassified part of those were classified, like locations of the training and what exactly they did. And, uh, but, it, but in these reports, it, it was very interesting how they, they you know, they, they have like data and, and uh, uh, Mr. Ty Tyrone, Director Tyrone is correct that according, in the years that they had, we were talking about that they had reported, of course, much less activity than what they were permitted for. But I guess so I wanted to know what, do we have any influence on the national permitting process? 
so I know that they notify you when they're going to do the training and exercise, but that's all after the permits have been granted. But prior to the uh, and National Marine Fisheries Service, prior to them issuing a permit, do they, do they ask any of our agencies for input and do, do we get to say that amount is too, too high or not? So if you're talking about the uh, uh, permit that is subject to consistency review under federal consistency, they must be consistent to the maximum except practical. And if they do not obtain the federal consistency, um, we, if they don't get concur uh, concurrence from our office, then my understanding is that the federal agency must deny the permit without prejudice. Okay. The so was one done for 20 in 2015? I have to I have to research and get back to you, ma'am. All right. Evangeline, were you going to say something, Ms. Luhan? Oh, I'm sorry. I was talking to Brett. Oh, okay. <laughs> I wanted to say that much similar to the MPDS permit, there is a public comment on all federal permits, and so I think the the thing is that we really have to be aggressive about going to it. It's not they're going to say, hey, people, on Guam, there's some permits for you to review. You have to always look out at all these federal agencies, what is put out on, on a, uh, at the federal level that these, there's, they're open for public comment. And so I was just right. asking, Brett, because I know in majority of, of all federal permits, there is a public hearing process, and yes. they give you, once before the permit is issued, there's a 60-day comment period. And so I think that that is, we just need to be more aggressive about that. And I, I also just wanted to make a comment. Um, I don't, I'm not sure if this activity falls under the programmatic agreement, but certainly it does fall as Edwin and, and Mr. Tyrone has mentioned the federal consistency. I think that we don't necessarily, we need to get very comfortable with util utilizing that tool as a, a mechanism of, of not being behind the cart, but in front of the, the horse in that you, that is a tool that we have used in the past to say, I'm sorry, you're not going to get your activity approved by us unless you follow these conditions. I, th I, w I think that the public needs to look at consistency because that also is open to the public for comments. And maybe, Edwin, you can correct me, but lucky if the public makes any comments. And these are federal activities that all of us are allowed to review and to say, hey, I don't particularly like that. Um, but one of the things is that Similar to the Guam Land Use Commission, the federal consistency is that approval process for all federal activities, including uh, that are funded through federal grants, that you can condition that. So maybe we're not saying, because in this partnership under the one Guam, we don't want to say no, but what we want to say is, okay, you may have to, you may get your yes, but here are all the things we're asking you to do, including things like, uh, before you enter into a building permit or getting your contractor in, we want to be able to look at the plans. So you can, there's a lot of variety of conditions that you can place on the consistency approval that I think that the agencies can um, put their comments on, similar to what you're suggesting under the programmatic agreement, but really the power lies on the, on the gentleman at the end of the table. Yes. I Thank you for that. Yes, we've discussed this with the agency and also with, uh, again, the governor's office, hoping to coordinate just such a thing. And I think that's why all these agencies are very active in, in their responses to this MIT. It's to inform, it's to inform that process and a coordinated yes. uh, if, I'm, if I may say, Senator, um, one of the directions we receive from Governor Leanne Guerrero is to uh, be proactive in this process and, and essentially do our jobs. Uh, one of the unfortunate aspects regarding the military build-up process is the degree of distrust that's been attached to the process, in part, in my personal opinion, is that many people are, do not have confidence that the local government agencies are actually doing their jobs, are actually stepping up and looking out for the interests. I know this is a frustration you and Senator Torres have, have faced in the, uh, in, the, in the previous term, and I, I certainly think the people to your left and right have, have shared, if not exceeded, that, that, frus uh, uh, that frustration as well. And it, it's, it's why we sort of examine this process as thoroughly as possible. And from the Bureau's angle, in terms of the uh, federal consistency, it's very much a, a technical, evidence-based, database process. And so we'll go where the data uh, takes us. 
Uh, regarding respect to the gap between local policy and, and the federal statutes here, there are often avenues in uh, looking for federal consistency is that to the extent there is a broader policy premise for a federal standard or the federal standard itself is general, there are often avenues for using um, local uh, law as a basis to interpret those standards. Uh, one area, uh, for example, I, I believe is in the coral reefs area. Coral reefs are, believe it or not, a bit of a backwater in federal policy. They get a tiny bit of federal funding. Uh, it's rising to national uh, prominence because of a huge uh, outbreak of a stony coral disease in, in Florida that's ravaged like 200 nautical miles of coral reefs going from uh, the South Florida area down to the Keys. And so that's, it's, and it's spreading through the Caribbean. Uh, but um, the, the local laws regarding coral reefs and, and takes are a lot more specific than I believe the federal laws are. And so that might be a basis to examine the coral reef situation, whereby we can use local law as a way uh, of influencing the process through federal consistency. Thank you very much. Yes, that's an excellent idea and suggestion. That's something that I know the Senator Perez and the other senators have also discussed. So perfect. Uh, we're looking forward to your recommendations and your assistance in, in this process. I don't have any questions. Senator Torres. Certainly a lot of information to digest and I appreciate having all of you here at the, the table. Um, it's a privilege to have all of you give us the in insightful information. But as, as I was thinking about the his historical significance um, of some of these sites, is it fair to say that we have an accurate inventory of, of what the preeminent historical sites are on Guam, or is that a, a well-kept secret or not even sufficiently surveyed? Uh, we, we don't have an accurate uh, listing. Uh, and the list that we do have is, is, is really just because somebody went out and, and did that survey. But, uh, and again, we don't know until we actually go through and comb the area. Uh, so, uh, so that list continues to, to, to increase as we move on and as we uh, forge our way into developing these areas. And I thought about that, uh, Mr. Lotz. I know that you have uh, certain books on, on hiking sites, but we're also aware that a lot of the historical significance of, of sites are not disclosed to help protect them. Is that correct? So people may not even understand the significance of the terrain that they're traversing. I think that's a very important point. And I will say relative to your comment about historic sites, I would say there's a pretty good list of historic sites, but just by its nature, it's incomplete. Um, one example, I wanted to discuss archaeological sites. We've got really good surveys on archaeological sites. They principally look at laddie stones. They're, they're the most visible characteristic. Uh, beyond that, you look at where you find pieces of pottery called pottery shards and dark mitten. Uh, but what it needs to evolve is into a larger area such as uh, where trails existed. And then beyond that, it's also what were the places where the, basically the, the food that the people uh, harvested and along with the food, the, uh, the, the um, aquatic creatures. So that's where you would get a, an interface with the, the um, aquatic animals. And of course the tie-in is it, it served a cultural, either served a cultural function or continues to serve uh, a cultural function. For example, uh, there's a, a component of historic preservation called traditional cultural properties, where if we've been doing the same activity for decades, more or less continuously, that's, that's part of the culture. And we talk about, uh, and we all are aware of the seasonal Manyahak runs. If, for example, the Marine or the military training were to have a disruptive impact 
on that sort of activity, then you can apply the National Historic Preservation Act. So I don't know if, if that would happen or not. Perhaps that's where there needs to be a, another discussion to see if there is an impact. I, I don't know the history of the, uh, of, the, of the rabbit fish. It's something to learn, but there's a potential interface, and that's just one example of this. <laughs> what what uh, brought that question to is I was wondering, you know, it, to what extent can we have a historical place or area be compelling enough to s actually stop a project or halt a project or alter a project plan? Because, you know, we see instances where, for example, up north where there was the one area that had some historical an archaeological significance, and yet it it, it wasn't historic. It wasn't significant enough to to slow down or stop or prevent development yeah. of the area. And and so, what is that magic formula that we can come up with to say this is the absolute threshold that will then affect plans going f forward or permits going I'm, forward? I'm somewhat presuming you're talking about the. Navy's destruction of the cultural resources of Magua Village, which uh, I don't think our state historic preservation officer performed enough diligence, but even before it got to that level, why did the Navy think they could just destroy those resources? I think that shows a level of really uh, bad respect for the community of Guam. So that's one reason why I, I'm i very leery of a programmatic agreement because it streamlines the process. Without a programmatic agreement, every project would have to be reviewed. And I think that is something that we need to learn from this. But again, it, it really needs uh, diligence, coordination, and just general public awareness and, and oversight such as you're conducting today. Thank you. Senators, if, if I may, what I wanted to also mention on, as far as an agency, we have actually put forth many documents uh, and those have actually been registered or, or submitted to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. We have done a state wildlife action plan, a 300-page-plus document that uh, summarizes and identifies many of the different uh, habitats that are actually mentioned in, 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 the, in, the, uh, in the, uh, the proposed action. We have done comment, made comments to uh, DOD's Integrated Natural Resource Management Plan, also known as the NRAM. Uh, so we've done that. We've, we've done, on a legal uh, uh, basis, the establishment of Guam's MPAs. And so we as an agency have actually, and just to go one more step, we've identified critical habitat, uh, and I believe the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has, those, has that information. And so we, and those summarizes the habitat critical for the perpetuation and, and continuance of the endangered species. So we have many, many different uh, uh, actions and, 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 and we've done those actions as far as the uh, preservation and protection of bombs and endangered species, if you would. And so I think we've done as much as we could. What always frustrates me it's a local action, and it's really up to the federal government to, to take, and, and I think we've done it on our end as far as make communication with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, our our uh, feelings and, and what we think and, and as far as uh, the MID is concerned, and share that with them as well. Thank you. If I may, Senator, a lot of what is discussed here goes again back to getting accurate data. Um, regarding your concern about historic preservation sites, um, 
the historic president office has, I'm told, traditionally been very, um, had an, a, a very uh, tight-lipped about their own GIS historical data, in part because of the legitimate concern that if it's too broadly available, it may open it to vandalism and people uh, uh, taking historic properties away. However, I'm sure you can appreciate it does not actually help uh, uh, the overall planning processes for these sites. Or, for example, making a case regarding the MIT, if, you know, if the, or the better case we can make to protection of these sites in the MIT is the more information we have about them, particularly on GIS overlay. So that's one of the issues probably in developing a, a, a firmer policy on this one is to sort of expand the range by which this information is used in order for a larger uh, argument beyond protection from vandalism. Day. So, as people were providing testimony for their agencies, I wrote down specific points and had some questions that I'd like to go through. So, one of the things with the MIT activities is that there will be the continued live bombing practices going on at Fairlawn de Medinitza. Now, I realize that's outside of Guam, but we are one archipelago, we are connected, our uh, marine life does not just stay around our waters, it goes up and down the archipelago, as do some of our other animal life. Um, and so with, with that, uh, and I was, when I was having this discussion with them, they were talking about that one of the, one or more of the options is looking to increase the live bombing. And they said that there is that three nautical mile uh, permanently restricted zone around the island and that there are live bombs that they leave there in place. So when Mr. Edwin Rages was discussing for the Bureau of Statistics and Plans and he was um, talking about needing to look at expended material, how that should not be posing contamination threats and so forth, um, it came to my mind, those life bombs that are left there in place. So I asked the military representatives uh, what the standard operating procedure was for those live bombs. They said that live bombs either A, miss their target and so land in that three mile zone around the island, or they might bounce off the island before they detonate and then therefore land in that area. And when I asked them how they cleared it, they said that they do not. They leave it in place. And then when I asked at what point they clear it, they said, oh, it's much too dangerous to do that, to clear it or to uh, detonate it in place or, or elsewhere. So <laughs> then when I went further and I said, okay, Fairlawn de Medinitza is leased. That lease at some point will come to an end. What is going to be the procedure to clear it at that point? And their answer was, there is no plan to clear it. Uh, there might be a plan to clear some of it, but there's no plan to clear it. So then I began asking them questions about, um, I've lived in Palau for a few years. They are still clearing up after World War II, as we are. Um, there was a life bomb found down the street from my house, actually, just the other week. And part of what they were having to do was to clear the live bombs out of the water because they were leaking and they had to tell divers not to go in those areas because they would get uh, burning sensations on their skin and so forth. So all of these things make me extremely concerned about any life bombs in our archipelago potentially affecting our marine life, potentially affecting uh, fishers who may or may not be in that area before or after that lease is in place. Uh, do you have any comments on those live bombs, their, uh, their future potential for contaminating our waters and our marine life? Um, I'd like to hear from Mr. Edwin and 
others that might have a point? Sure, Senator Titano, you make a very good point. And one of the things that we really want to look at is that connectivity among the arch archipelago. Um, so that, that can span across the multiple species. So for example, corals, we want to know if corals are able to, if they're spawning in the system, how does it affect the entire chain? And one of the things that we can commit to you is we can work closely with our partners here, but also with our coastal zone program in the CNMI to have a joint response to look at this as a systematic, um, <clears throat> potential systematic impact to, to our coastal zone. So while the activity may not be occurring within the three mile radius, it doesn't mean that these species know that boundary. And so if, they're gonna, if there is a potential impact, we wanna know about it, whether it's corals or fish or any other uh, animals that could be impacted by those bombs. That's a very good point. Thank you. We do know from tagging that uh, both false killer whales and pilot whales do migrate between Guam and the Northern Islands and also the false killer whales migrate to the uh, islands, the Western Mariana Arc, which is about 100 miles to the west of us, which is now included in the new uh, MIT range. It was not included in the original. So there is a potential there. We also know that sea turtles have gone, we've tagged sea turtles have gone between here and the Northern Marianas or vice versa as well. So we know f certainly that those species have the potential. Also, uh, a few years ago, the National Park Service did look at uh, the ordinance that was left in the water outside uh, Park Service properties on Guam to look at potential impacts of water chemistry and such. And offhand, I don't know what the results of those were, but that might be a source for some information on that as well. In regard to uh, former range sites and, and cleanups, um, Guam EPA through the circular process, uh, process has, and I just came back from the meetings in Hawaii with the Army Corps and, and NAFAC PAC that do, do cleanups for active or former ranges and former bombing. So technology is, is rapidly increasing on their detection on land. We're still trying to get them to be more cooperative in underwater. Um, but Brett brought up about outside Aston War Memorial Park that was brought up with them. They're looking, the Navy again will look into seeing what they can actively do with the, U, the UXOs that uh, the monitoring team has videoed showing that they're stacked and not an active war, which is a, one of the requirements that it not be an active war. And I think that has more to do with if they clean up any active war, then they'll be liable to clean up any, any active war throughout the world. And I don't, I can't say even DOD's policy, but we've showed that this is not an act of war. It was a cleanup that was done. So we're, we're trying to address that. Um, the Army Corps, uh, we just got uh, funding to do a site south of Anderson on the eastern side of the island. There are going to be boots on the ground people here looking for uh, former munitions that may have been left on the island. Uh, so uh, it was a very productive meeting. I look forward to speaking to you guys on it on a one-to-one -one basis and informing you. But uh, bottom line is DOD knows and have studies on those questions that you have. Maybe when you asked it to the people that were doing the training, they weren't qualified to speak about it. But I definitely can assist to getting you those answers because they've done lots of studies because this isn't something new to them. They've been trying to do these cleanups throughout the United States as, as well as the territories. And so we do have some information on some of the impacts it may have, uh, especially on the land side. Again, on the water side, they're, they're still fighting to say it's their responsibility, but we're still fighting on our end to, to ensure that people of Guam didn't put it there. You guys did, so fester up and let's get this done. So um, I can definitely work with you, Senator, on trying to get you some of that information. Thank you. So do a for that. Uh, in, any additional information is always welcome. Um, it's, it's very much appreciated and needed for our entire community. So for those that I was speaking with, um, they referenced Kaholave, and they said, well, in Kaholave, um, so this is an island, a sacred island in Hawaii that is still being cleaned up um, many years, if not decades later, um, from what I remember, just to have a very brief um, summary of that, is that the military did do cleanup 
for a certain period of time. And then, from what I understand, they said, okay, we've cleaned it up enough. And then they left. And now the state of Hawaii has hundreds of millions of dollars of cleanup to do on their own. And so what this gentleman told me, he's the one who heads up all the Section 106 and other uh, public forums out here, and he's been part of this whole process uh, for the last 10 years. And uh, so what he gave me as an answer is, well, perhaps we'll clear a path or two like we did at Kaholave of those live bombs. So I'm hoping that the answer is going to be better than that if we continue to look further. But at this point, it, it was not very heartening. Um, and I really like the direction that some of the discussion went in. Um, I think the socioeconomic impacts are really important so that when we're talking about uh, these marine resources or some of the land-based training, uh, that we are looking at socioeconomic impacts to our resources. And so with this, um, did anybody see any information about long-term impacts to our, our fishing, our traditional, our ancestral, our subsistence, uh, and other fishing, and, and I do want to point out, now I have not looked as thoroughly at this supplemental environmental impact statement as I have for other impact statements, um, but I was very disturbed by other environmental impact statements in their, what I consider loose terms, where they call something recreational fishing when it is familial, it is traditional, it is ancestral, it is cultural, and it is subsistence. So to wave it away and say that it is recreational, and it's okay to take this spot away, these nine square miles, these other several square miles, these three nautical mile zone around an island is okay because they can just fish somewhere else, I think does not do justice to the cultural traditions that have been here for thousands of years. But I'm digressing a bit. So uh, did you read anything about long-term fishing impacts in the environmental impact statement? Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me, is it, uh, one thing I'd mentioned earlier is the potential impact of accessibility to the southern banks with activities in uh, Area Whiskey 517. Additionally, the uh, expansion of the warning areas outside the small arms firing ranges, uh, the one near the Double Reef area and uh, Arodi Point, and the proposed one up around uh, Retidian, also will impact the ability for vessels to get in there for fishing also. And uh, the, the frequency of the activities is, wasn't clear, and the method of notification of fishermen when they were going to be active and not you know, and access would not be allowed. Uh, either wasn't clear or wasn't sufficient, I felt. We made some recommendations to, to certainly make better awareness to the fishing community when these areas would be off limits, but also uh, the, some of the justification for the expansion of these was, was questionable, I felt, as well. And I appreciate you making a point earlier um, and letting people know how many days out of the year we're talking about. That yeah. it could be 120 days, it could be as many as um, I believe with some of the proposals around the Northwest Field, Tailalo, Litex, and Retidian area. It was maybe about 273 days, 37 days, uh, but it was over 200 days up uh, potentially. So we're talking about some real substantial loss for our community and these are some of the, the um, prime fishing areas. So with that, um, there was also mentioned by the coastal zone management section about uh, lack of public access. And so me as an anthropologist, part of what I look at here and am very concerned about is with the loss of fishing, with the loss of public access, with the loss of some of these traditional activities, 
Um, I'd like to see some real studies being done uh, and put into the environmental impact statement if they're not there, but some studies being done about the long-term impact on culture and cultural identity. Um, when people are kept out of these traditional familial ancestral fishing areas that maybe their grandparents, it, that being the place that their grandparents taught them to fish at, um, you know, I really worry about um, those kind of impacts. And so I'm not sure that they're fully in the environmental impact study, but uh, I would definitely like to be calling for them in my public comments. Um, let's see. Senator, if I may. Yes. Just to add to your Ooh. statement, you. I think what it is, is not, not only experiencing the, uh, the uh, traditional uh, to, or the tradition of fishing, it's losing the opportunity to pass it on. I think that's very critical. We also got to keep in mind, it's not only do we have the tradition, are we being allowed the opportunity to pass that tradition? And I think that's what you were alluding to as far as that goes, is that, you know, some of us will not be around. And, and those of us who know how to use the taladza will be gone and the next generation may not have that opportunity to learn. And I think that's gonna be a total loss for the island and its culture. I really appreciate you bringing that point forward. Um, you know, I was thinking about it sort of in the immediate and, and looking down the road to a degree, but I hadn't quite thought it through to that degree. And that's really something, if, if that area is being closed off from us to not be able to take then the next generation to that family spot and to teach them those traditional skills. I, I think that's a really important point that we should be concerned about. Just to, uh, to and Brent will appreciate this, the, uh, our kids fishing derby, we have that as an annual event and that's coming up and so you see all that. What we've done is also allowed parents to go fishing with their kids so that that bond and connection I think is going on as well. And so that's where we as an agency are emphasizing that as a real important aspect of learning how to fish. It's not only learning how to fish the person, but also allowing the parent to pass that tradition on. I think that's real crucial as far as that goes. Uh, Senator, uh, a couple of years ago, the Guam Historic Preservation Office uh, promulgated guidelines for identification of traditional cultural properties. Uh, the discussion that you're leading is, is clearly fits in that purview. And traditional cultural properties uh, can be listed or considered eligible for the National Register of Historic Places. And, and subject to section 106 reviews, and I think uh, that would be uh, appropriate to, to pursue in, in this regard to the MID and other potential federal activities. Senator, if I just may just add um, one more thing. You're, yes. you're, you're um, uh, honing in on public access is uh, very important. And one of the things that we also want to consider is whether or not the activity is causing a deterrence. And so that can be considered an effect to public access if they are creating an op uh, a situation where you're restricting free-flowing nature of our oceans. So for example, if just their pure posture represents our, uh, or causes our ships to have to maneuver, or if, encounter, uh, uh, if the fishermen encounter a situation where they, um, their patterns are disrupted, those all can uh, equal um, uh, an effect to public access. So we'll be looking at that very closely under the federal consistency process, and thank you for bringing that up. So just Masi for that, and that's very good to hear that you are looking at those things specifically. Again, they are extremely important. And we've talked about it uh, in a variety of ways, but it's true, no area's cultural resource listing is ever complete. It's never um, comprehensive because it's an ongoing process. 
And so we are very much fitting into that uh, along with everybody else. One of the things that I think has really been undersurveyed, and you know, there are reasons why, why areas have not been surveyed. Um, right now, a lot of the surveying that we do is very development driven. Uh, and that's just one of the realities that we deal with. But I think an area that's very underserved and highly um, in, being highlighted right now by the United Nations and others is our underwater cultural heritage. We have fish weirs that um, we just don't even know how many or where they are or where they used to be. The only ones that I'm aware of that have been documented are down there at APRA. And so uh, those types of cultural resources, especially why, while all these sorts of activities are being proposed, I think we need to figure out some way to be safeguarding what is not surveyed and documented yet or figuring and or figuring out ways to get those areas documented and surveyed because I think there's a wealth of, of sites that we don't even know about right now. I, I certainly agree and now that I'm thinking about this discussion, I think, I think it might be wise to approach the historic preservation officer and just say, Virtually our whole coastal area and reefs should be considered a traditional cultural property and that'd be the simplest way to get that designation instead of doing bits and pieces and I think we all are, are very much aware of, we see fishermen in really remote locations, uh, which is a real, a, a real cultural asset. Right, those fishing banks that you referred to, um, we have them in the historical documents. Some of them have been passed down through the generations. And so I think that they are definitely a cultural resource that needs to be looked at in particular ways and certainly areas that need to be protected. Um, let's see. Um, I do want to mention that I'm looking forward to the 11 pages of comments. Uh, those are important for us to, to have. It was really important to hear about the vessel strikes. Um, important for us to be hearing that some of what we're seeing in the EIS is older data, and so it's not necessarily current. Um, that's a very important consideration. And, you know, one of the things, um, not to get back to the programmatic agreement too much, but uh, one of the things that I found very disturbing at these set of consultations that they've been having recently is this proposal to bifurcate or separate our programmatic agreement between the Northern Mariana Islands and Guam. And so I've been trying to reach out to the Northern Mariana Islands and others on Guam to push for keeping it together. Uh, for many of the reasons that you have outlined for us today, our marine mammals, they don't, they don't follow those boundaries. Um, the waters flow back and forth. We get volcanic material that lands on our waters from the north. Like there are so many ways that we're connected. Our families are connected, the culture is connected, our historic sites are connected, our cultural resources and natural resources, they're connected. And so I'm, I'm very troubled by any proposal to further bifurcate. And it was uh, the mention, I believe, it was yourself um, when we were talking about solid waste and, and noting that if it's generated elsewhere, it should not be coming here. And I think those are the kind of things that can be caught, um, made, made obvious to us or more obvious to us if we're keeping our programmatic agreement together, that we're keeping as much of the undertaking, the looking at the actions, our consultations, our communications across the borders. Like I think the more that we're working with each other across the entire archipelago, the better. Because there are many ways that it may be unintentionally or just because we're, we're not aware 
something that is happening there is impacting us here, that we're ending up with their solid waste. Something that's happening here is creating impacts there. And so to me, I, I just want to continue promoting to the general community, to our leadership, both here and in NMI, that we continue to look at this all together because I think if it's partitioned too much, intentionally or unintentionally, we have a lot of consequences as a result of that. And so I really want to appreciate many of the things that you said that really helped me continue to better realize that potential for impact back and forth. Um, so those are, those are the main questions and points that I have. Uh, others may still have more. Um, just one last thing. I just want to thank uh, all of you for uh, participating in this and being the regula regulatory body behind a lot of these activities. I know we've been through this for the past 10 years and more. And I feel like um, I want to touch upon what Vanjie has said, as well as Senator Torres. You know, what is that threshold where enough is enough? And I think what's important is to develop a cumulative framework. Um, because, you know, all these projects from the MIT to the Merck to, uh, you know, Finnegadzen to the, the Texan, you know, all of these projects is really one huge project. And I, I'm hoping that we can go forward from today in developing a cumulative framework where we can address the problems. I mean, one of the things you're bringing up is the, you know, what, what another thing my colleague, um, Senator Marsh Titano was talking about is the accumulation of, of bombs in one island. Where does that waste go to if they do clean it up? And what is a toxic burden on our population? Uh, is it causing all our, uh, the health problems that we're seeing is it, or is it aggravating the health problems that we're seeing in our community? So I think that, you know, going forward, we need to look at this. Also, the MIT, the idea that it's a testing and training ground. What technology are we being exposed to that, you know, and how is it impacting our community? How is it impacting our, our environment? Is it something new? Is it being tested here or nowhere else in the world? Um, if it is, is this something that we're, we can accept? Because, you know, are we being tested on? This is the, the ultimate, you know, this is what eventually is, is what we're talking about. It's, it's, it's testing and training their technology, but it's also we're part of this, this project, and unintentionally and without our consent. So that's just some of the comments and questions that I have um, for you guys. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you to all of you. Very, very great discussion. I know you could go on probably for hours, and uh, I'm sorry to keep you this long, but uh, thank you all for the, the time and attention that you put into this. Again, there is a deadline that was published at one time to be April 17. I know that there was a recent publication in the paid newspaper that says April 27, so we're trying to get clarification, but for right now, we're all acting on the April 17, just an, and, a, and we, we just encourage you and, and the public to share your comments. I think this is going to be one of our strengths on Guam as we, we hear from each other, we share our expertise with each other so that we can back each other up. And like, like he said, this process is very difficult. There are uh, comment periods probably ongoing for different projects, different aspects of it. You know, after we get through the MIT, then they, they actually do the announcement for the training, and then they do the announcement for the, uh, changing the safety zones, and we comment on different aspects. So I know that as agencies, you're probably always uh, uh, burdened with these, you know, having to respond in a very short time frame, and the public also. And I think uh, I just want to thank everyone who's participated and done a very good job of, you know, putting Guam's... Um, input in and but especially you the agencies to for informing us of, of what you you know and what yet yeah, the more we know the more we can protect so um there being no ad additional individuals 
To present further testimony, the committee will submit a report on this joint informational briefing and all documents discussed will be filed with the legislature and available on the Guam legislature's website within 30 days. Now, if you'd like to share your comments with the public, I, I would suggest you submit it to the media, but you can submit it to us and we will try to put it up on our individual websites also so the so public can access those and just in our way help you to get those comments out. Uh, if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact uh, myself at 472-3586 or via email Senator Terlahi Guam at gmail.com or Senator Sabina Perez at 989-2968 or office at senatorperez.org. And I'm sure all of the agencies welcome also public input or questions as into the, their role in this process. And the public hearing is now adjourned.